All right. Well, I won't waste um, much more time. Uh, we've got a lot to get to today, so I want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Lindsay Mulcahy. I'm the Neighborhood Outreach Coordinator at the LA Conservancy. And welcome to the latest conversation in our People Plus Places series. Uh, this is called The Art of Preservation. Um, I am really excited to welcome our panelists. We've got Maya Santos, Sam Nakahira, and Elizabeth Ito, uh, who are going to be in, in dialogue with me and all of you today. So feel free, folks, to turn on your cameras and um, we'll be getting started as people continue to, to trickle in. Um, welcome you all. Feel free to continue to add in your name and um, where you're coming from in the chat. Uh, it's great to see what um, an international group we've got so far, as well as um, a lot of local folks as well. All right, before we dive um, into this panel, I want to just offer a little framing for the discussion that's um, going to follow. For me, and I imagine many of you, the, the physicality and tangibility of historic places really can offer some unique opportunities for storytelling and ways to connect people and movements that have come before us. Um, these older places are also rich with memory and symbolism that can inspire us to innovate and respond to new challenges in ways that are informed uh, but not limited by the past. So today's conversation is for preservationists who aspire to use storytelling to connect people and places, um, and also for artists and cultural workers who maybe don't call themselves preservationists, but who use place as a way to explore themes of identity, belonging, culture, and, and so much more. Um, so for a discussion that's rooted in land, uh, I want to begin by recognizing that myself and others in the Los Angeles Basin live on unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people who are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land, its water, and its cultural resources. Um, I won't uh, spend much more time in front of the mic and uh, we'll pass it off to a really brilliant artist uh, to introduce themselves and share their practices in their own words. And after we've gotten a taste of each of their work, I'll kick off the discussion with some questions and we'll invite you all to, to join us in using the Q&A. Um, so I'll start with uh, documentarian and screenwriter Maya Santos. Welcome. Feel free to share your screen. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, happy to be here. I'm going to start sharing the screen and get into introducing myself. One second. Okay. So, hello. <laughs> My name is Maya Santos. My pronouns are she, her. I'm currently uh, speaking from uh, occupied Duwamish territory, also known as Seattle, Washington. Um, I am many things, uh, an architect, a multimedia artist, educator, um, but today I'm speaking to you about being a place-based documentarian, uh, screenwriter, and cultural space advocate. I'm mainly going to be sharing about a collaborative studio, um, a place-based collaborative studio called Forum Follows Function, which existed from 2011 to 2020 in Los Angeles, where I lived as well. And um, this collaborative studio was a combination of um, so many people, so many talented artists who were really passionate about places and um, the environment around us. So I can't name everyone that we collaborated with, but I want to um, share, uh, you know, the people at the top here were my main uh, team uh, and I was the creative director. And we basically created a lot of short format, nonfiction, place-based uh, media uh, mostly in the form of short documentaries, but also expanded into um, multimedia, immersive media, installations, anything that would really um, help to advocate and tell stories about places. So we explored how places were shaped through history, people, and culture. 
And our guiding principle was that a growing relationship to our environment will enhance our quality of life as people. So through media, we explored new ways of seeing ourselves and the world around us. Yet I would also say that we were exploring ways of seeing ourselves through the world around us. So place-based storytelling for us, um, our goal was to tell stories about places as told by people who know them. We also shared, wanted to share history as it was known through a place. And we wanted to advocate for places that need to stay um, and engage people, of course, with where they are and with who is around. So again, really focusing on that quality of life for, um, for people and um, how they relate to the built environment. So what we found was uh, that a place really, by centering a place in a story, a place really allows people to locate a tactile experience. Uh, a place can reflect multiple experiences and perspectives and disarm personal beliefs. A uh, place can reflect a multiplicity of narratives and timelines. And the most exciting thing is you can tell many stories through one place, which always really fascinated with fascinated me. Um, and a place reflects common experience, experiences that can be universal. And then a place can also tell an objective story, but can also be personal and meaningful. So oftentimes we, when we were telling a story of a place, what we were really looking for was what the soul of that place is. Even if, you know, you don't believe that a place can have a soul, but if a place were to have a soul, what would it be? So um, I wanna take a moment now because uh, I know we're speaking about um, tangible histories and intangible histories of places. And this is one of those intangible places, a place that does not exist anymore. Um, but this was our very first documentary um, in 2011 about the Youth Break Center, which is also known as Radiotron. And it was a, a very legendary place for a West Coast hip hop where um, Carmelo Alvarez here, who we met, was the uh, organizer and uh, creator of this space who um, basically had an after school program where young people around MacArthur Park all over LA would come and um, break dance and also create murals and, um, and really had a strong community um, centered in hip hop. And uh, the space actually was also a site where the movie in the eighties called Break In was shot. And um, that's, uh, and it was many other things aside from that. And Carmelo will speak to us about that in this video clip that I'm gonna share for a few minutes. Um, so don't mind me, I'm gonna this kind of, Switch tabs. Mr. Hunsberger, which was the owner of the, this property, gave me the building, but he sold the land to make this. The Youth Break Center, also known as Radiotron, is about to lose its clubhouse. The center in the MacArthur Park area will soon be giving way to development, and Carmelo Alvarez is looking for help. Uh, we'd like the city council to help us to find a vacant lot somewhere in the MacArthur Park area where we could actually pick up the building and move it there. The building you're in now. Exactly. But no, no city officials showed up. So we couldn't save the building and the building got demolished. And now it's a little mini mall here. And that's what happened. This would be like the lobby. It's like the offices? This, was, this would be like my office right here, right? And then you have like the another office here that we convert into a snack bar. And then you have like the two bathrooms. And then you have a stairway going up. And then here would be like the door right here. And I'd say this would be the door. Like the double door, right? Double door opens up. And then you're going into 
between the hardwood floors there, between the little stage. Then it had a little balcony. It was really, really a nice little building. Beautiful little theater space. It's awesome, you know. Can't find that. The building itself was built like sometime in the 1920s because when I used to open the fuse box and I used to peel back some of the stickers, I noticed that the different people, it was uh, the CSO, you know, like for the servicemen, for, which was in World War I for the, what they called the Doughboys. Then it was a union hall. It was even Scientology. Even uh, it was a hay market, like where Jane Fonda spoke. It was an underground like clubs. We had the circle jerks there. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was incredible. But it became more famous for being a youth center where kids from all over, all backgrounds, you know, all parts of the city would want to come here and dance and do art. And that's what, it, that, what's, what it's really known as. It's called the Youth Break Center. And it was about giving the youth a break and let them be creative. And so Radiotron, um, as a piece, uh, actually featured on KCET, where we, Form Follows Function, had a, uh, a blog series, and we called it Traces, uh, Traces of Place, where we um, started featuring all these videos and wrote about it, too. And um, so Radiotron continues to celebrate um, this heritage of uh, West Coast hip hop in uh, MacArthur Park every year. And so it was a great uh, way to be part of that continued celebration. The next piece I wanted to talk about is uh, a collaboration with LA Conservancy on the Garden Apartments um, campaign. We called We Heart Garden Apartments. And so this was in 2014 where Adrian Fine and had, we worked with Adrian Fine on exploring ways to promote the garden apartment network and to really um, help advocate for these garden apartments that were increasingly at risk as uh, high density planning um, accelerates for Los Angeles. So Villages in the City was the short documentary that we created and we highlighted three places uh, throughout LA that were garden apartments, but were at very different stages in their um, historic recognition. And um, so looking at Lincoln Place in Venice, which was um, undergoing a, a renovation, but a historic rehab. And then Village Green, which was um, restored and uh, very celebrated garden apartments in Baldwin Hills and also Wyvernwood in Boyle Heights, which was not um, as recognized and was being threatened with demolition um, at this time. So what we wanted to do was really highlight all these places, but really point um, the direction toward Wyvernwood and why it's not as recognized as the other two garden apartments. And so with that, I wanted to share a little clip of this piece. Ese lugar, si se tumba, es donde serían los edificios más altos, serían los rascacielos, y es el lugar más importante para vivir nuestras tradiciones, ese lugar. Entonces, todo esto nos destruiría, donde hemos vivido todo lo más hermoso new modern buildings, taller buildings, they may be luxurious, you know, but the biggest luxury is, is that, that friendliness and that sense of community that we have created. I'm very uh, proud to throw my support behind the community that you see here that's saying, we want our community as it is. Yes, it needs improvements. We'd rather see those billions of dollars invested and what exists here now. We're focusing on preservation of historical buildings, preservation of, of our culture, of the sense of community, you know, of the events we've created here, and the families that we've created here as well. This architecture was designed to create quality housing for working class people. 
and preservation allows us to do that, to maintain that. In areas that are threatened with gentrification, where moneyed interests want to take over, where rent control is dying, where people can't afford to live. We'll never have this open land to do this sort of thing again, and so we really have to preserve the ones that we have. They're some of the finest examples in the whole country. In no hay un lugar como este que exista para estimarse igual. Pensamos que ese es un pequeño pueblo dentro de una gran ciudad. Puede, puede, se, se puede decir es una joya aquí adentro. So that was Villages in the City uh, in 2014, a collaboration with, um, with LA Conservancy. And so I'll stop sharing and just end, start finishing up my slides here in a second. And this brings me to the last project I wanted to share about, which is uh, a multimedia um, site-specific project in 2017 called Bronzeville Little Tokyo. And it was a collaboration with uh, Visual Communications, um, a API media um, center in Little Tokyo. And it was a presentation for the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. And what we were doing here was to highlight the history of Bronzeville. Um, which is the period when uh, in World War II, when the Japanese Americans were incarcerated, um, Little Tokyo became known as Bronzeville, and um, and it was a largely Black and African American community where jazz clubs, breakfast clubs, um, businesses, and um, spaces all changed um, functions and served. Um, served that community for a period of three to four years. Um, and so we wanted to talk about this overlooked history through uh, multimedia. Um, so what we did was highlight a couple places uh, around First Street North, which was also a block that was very important to the community. Um, and folks were advocating for the preservation of um, so one site was the historic Nishi building and the other was the uh, Union Center for the Arts here, which is are both locations where Japanese Americans were uh, and Japanese were uh, picked up for to be incarcerated. Um, we also were using immersive and multimedia and live performances to draw in uh, a multi generational audience to the film festival. And we wanted to raise awareness about Bronzeville um, history in Little Tokyo and to activate the historic First Street North block. And we also wanted to bridge communities between Japanese American and African American communities of LA. So how we did that was through a, a few uh, in immersive media projects. One is the Memory Bank, which was a projection mapped open mic inside the Nishi building where we um, highlighted segments of the of memories of Bronzeville that was in the uh, this book called the the Great Black Way LA in the 1940s and we also hosted open mics for folks to share uh, different stories they had about little Tokyo or what they knew about Bronzeville in that space. We also, of course, had live jazz by uh, the Bronzeville Union, led by Dexter Story at the um, old Union Church. And we had a 360 VR animation um, by Kaleidoscope Studios um, in collaboration with us, which highlighted the breakfast clubs in the area, specifically um, following Char Charlie Parker and um, his ex his the stories about him around the area in the historic Civic Hotel and also the um, Finale Club, which was one of the famous breakfast clubs down the street. 
the finale club, this story actually was picked up by uh, Robert Shoji, who was part of the Little Tokyo community and a friend of Foreign Falls Function, who really highlighted this story about finale club and Charlie Parker and Miles Davis um, recording an album there in 1946. And so this is a view of First Street um, and the club was somewhere around there. And as a result of that, um, that piece, uh, Robert was working with the Little Tokyo Historical Society and um, they worked together to create a um, historic monument sign to recognize that that property was uh, known as the Finale Club and it was part of this great history of um, Little Tokyo Bronzeville. Again, we're just really happy to bring a multi-generational of folks together to celebrate these places. And this is just a walking tour we had as part of that event. Um, and yeah, really thankful to our collaborators in this time to share. Thank you so much. I, I think you're the perfect person to kick us off with um, not only hearing about the projects, but also the, the methodology. And I, I think we'll be going back to the idea of, of the soul of the place um, soon. Uh, but now I want to turn over the mic to um, our second panelist, Elizabeth Ito, uh, to, uh, yeah, kick us off and get started. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody out there who I can't see. Um, <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Ito. Uh, I made the show City of Ghosts um, that is on Netflix. It uh, came out in 2021. Um, I've been working in animation for a while <laughs> now, since like 2004. Um, I started out as a storyboard artist, and um, now I basically make shows, which is cool, a cool trajectory. A lot of things happen in between. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm here to kind of talk about how my work um, has connected to place, how it kind of has just always um, been something that's a part of me and a part of what it means to be a creative person um, where you are. Uh, so I'm going to share just a few images. Um, let me see if I can do this correctly. All right, so now you should be able to see uh, my bridge window. Um, this first image of this uh, mural is maybe like the first piece of public art that I was ever a part of. It was at um, Canyon Elementary School, which is in the Santa Monica Canyon, where I went to elementary school and where my mom taught for most of her career. Um, and uh, they had a, like a I don't, I don't know if it was a contest per se, but they had a thing where you could draw an animal um, as a carousel animal related to sort of how the Santa Monica Pier has that cool carousel with all the animals on it. Um, and so my favorite animal was a mouse, so I chose that. And uh, I think there were other animals also that were chosen. Um, and then all of the school helped to paint um, these murals. So. I think it's still there. I'm not sure um, if anybody out there is from Santa Monica or goes to that school, you can let me know or let somebody at the Conservancy know um, whether it's still there or not. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was always a really creative kid and I always really liked doing art wherever I was. Um, this next image is just uh, at some point, I started experimenting with adding my characters into environments on Instagram, which now doesn't sound like a big deal. Um, but I think at the time when I started doing it, it was kind of a big deal because um, I sort of had to cobble together a way to do that. So it was figuring out if there was like an app that would let me um, isolate my characters and layer them into photographs that I was taking. But I found a way to do that. And I guess, um, it was sort of the first excitement that I felt over um, putting my characters into places that people recognized. I mean, in this case, it was my house, so um, only really me and my family <laughs> recognized it. But um, it was really fun to go out in the world traveling and then put your characters in a place with your friends wherever you were hanging out. So I think that was sort of an ex exciting discovery. Um, I went on to do a short about my brother uh, that 
um, where I made the setting our high school because it was sort of about this big monster guy who doesn't feel like he fits in. Um, and the high school that I knew best was the high school that both uh, him and I went to. So I, um, some, I'm in my mind, it's miraculous because it was hard to do, uh, it's hard to get animation studios to agree to do something like technically kind of that difficult, but um, I got the permission to shoot all of the backgrounds at uh, my high school, which is Palisades High. Um, and a lot of things are shot there. So it wasn't really that hard to, to get to get in there to do that. But um, it it was a way to ground the story that I wanted to tell in a place that um, was where it happened, like uh, in real life. And I think um, that just started my thoughts about the connection between people and the stories that they tell and the ways that those things um, can't really be separated from each other sometimes. Um, a lot of times, I think, if you want something to feel 100% authentic, it has, to, it has to be set in a really specific place with really specific voices. Um, so next, uh, my next project, kind of after that personal project was City of Ghosts. Um, and this show did such a just, uh, I don't know, a great job for me. I guess that's the, the point of it. But it, it answered all of my needs about being curious about things that I didn't know um, in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is where I've lived my whole life. So um, it's a weird thing to say, but I was really excited to kind of um, find out things that to me were surprising, but um, like, I don't know, just to make stories out of them um, and to sort of just explore them at the same time as I'm getting to make a show about them. It was really amazing. I picked um, this particular image uh, of, um, this is from our episode where our group of kids, oh, I should set it up, but City of Ghosts is a show, documentary style show about Los Angeles. That's about this group of kids that find ghosts around the city to tell them about where they live um, and to tell them about what, why they're there. Um, so, I think this also answered um, these interests that I have about geography and about architecture and about the intersections of all the culture in our city. But um, I had to pick like six places. So it was uh, that was probably the hardest thing was to pick just six places to do. Um, and in this particular episode, I actually got to explore something that I didn't know anything about when we started the show, which was uh, in Koreatown, there's uh, a lot of, Oaxaca there's a big Oaxacan community um, that was just uh, incredible to find out about and to talk to. Um, and in this particular image, uh, we connected the two by, um, honestly, we asked Yulisa, who's the girl in the picture and not the ghost, um, is there stuff in Koreatown that you like that you feel like um, maybe you don't have in Oaxaca? And she picked Korean barbecue. And so we came up with this whole storyline that had to, had to do with um, this Oaxacan whistling ghost that's in the vents uh, that's hiding in there because he got lost. And um, it's it's all about him and uh, his best friend, Ulisa. Um, so uh, I think to sum that all up, it's just that I think place is really important to stories. And in, in animation in particular, I'm doing something relatively unique. Although I wrote a note to myself that like, I know Molly of Denali does that where you set your characters in a place that's very specific to those characters' lives. Um, and I think it's just something that really uh, helps people feel truly reflected in the in the stories that we tell and the media that we make. And I knew that I wanted to reflect um, the LA that I knew and also show the vibrancy of life here for kids um, in this city and in other cities too. I want other kids to get excited to find the same kinds of things in their own neighborhoods. Um, so like I said, we tried to connect with people who are from the places, each of the places that we visited in all of our episodes. Um, and I feel like we were able to get some very original and authentic stories uh, because of that. Um, 
this is just a little bit of behind the scenes. Um, so this is uh, our photographer Quasi and my husband Kevin. Um, we're working on getting all the backgrounds for um, just the, the, uh, this one's not for just one episode in particular because this is the library where they hang out. Um, so this is the them getting that shot. And then this is what that kind of ends up being. So this is the kids um, figuring out how to find a ghost in a Japanese restaurant um, in the very first episode. Uh, and this is at the, I think it's the Arroyo Seco branch of the library, if you actually want to find the real place where it is. Um, but I think what the show taught me was just that um, setting your stories in a specific place, um, like with people that are actually from there, um, it really invests children and adults, but um, I'm really more interested in the children part of it. Um, it invests them in all the things we want them to be invested in. It invests them in their neighborhoods, in the people in those neighborhoods, um, and the cultures in the that exist in those neighborhoods and the history. Um, and I think, yeah, it, we, should, we should do more of it. Um, and then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just to share uh, one more thing. Um, when I, this is just a random anecdote related to place, but uh, when we were making City of Ghosts, uh, my office flooded at some point. We were in this uh, building off of Sunset in Hollywood and they had to dig out the planter in like next to my office, like really, really deep. Like I could see it way down. And um, Akko, who is one of the directors and writers on my show, um, she uh, knows how to gather clay. And so, um, she at the end of the show she made me this little uh box that was a gift sort of this red string is kind of related to the show and then in this box was this little clay um chopsticks holder and so the clay um i think you can see it and on the back it says cog um the, the the clay comes from the place where we made the show so every time I look at it or touch it or like remember that it's there I feel really special feelings because um it's sort of it's it's just really nice that I have this thing that reminds me of this great uh time in my life um both connected to the place it was at and the person who made it and the people that helped me make the show so um yeah I think that's sort of all I have to share. <laughs> Figured I'd pass it on to Sam. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I think the, the creativity and curiosity that you talk about comes out so clearly in City of Ghosts. So if people haven't seen it already, I highly recommend it. All right, last but certainly not least is Sam Nakahira, our, our final panelist. Take it away, Sam. Oh, thank you, Lindsay at LA Conservancy for having me. Um, yeah, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, so I'm a comic artist and illustrator. I grew up in the South Bay, which is like in between LA and Orange County. Um, I prepared like a really short slideshow um, with some of my historical um, comics. Uh, so these are pages from my first uh, long-form narrative comic, um, which I made around Bill Fujim Fujimoto, who is a Japanese-American food retailer, and he used to run Monterey Market in Berkeley, California. Um, so in 2018, I was conducting these um, oral history interviews for like a school project, and I wanted to interview Japanese-Americans in California who had some connection like in some way to the land, like farming and food retail. Um, and yeah, I just felt like really hard for their stories and the way they talked about their farms and markets um, felt so beautiful. So I thought it would be like a waste to just use my research and interview transcripts for like an academic paper for school. I thought it would be cool to make comics out of them and kind of convey their humanity more and maybe share their stories with others. Um, so Bill Fujimoto ran this produce market where he like sourced all his produce from small local farmers in California, and he kind of cultivated this community space for farmers who like couldn't sell their produce in like more large brand markets. 
and yeah, connected these farmers with a lot of like restaurants in the Bay Area. I think this comic was like pretty important to my trajectory as an artist, um, because it kind of like I don't know, I think influenced my future comics. Um, I really like discovering like these hidden histories and illustrating them. Um, sometimes I think my work might be a little too niche, like it might not have like mainstream appeal. Um, but I think it's also cool, like um maybe like something you might not find so easily in history books or yeah, more media. And yeah, when I was working on this comic, I kind of wanted to create this feeling of walking around a busy market with a lot of different boxes of produce like set um, all around. And yeah, I guess I was kind of playing with like the power of comics to like convey a sense of place and bring people into an environment. Um, yeah, so I'm like very interested in using art to kind of like unlearn and relearn history. And I think it also helps me find hope in like imagining other worlds are possible that are like more community centered. Um, yeah, so these are some recent illustrations and comics that I've made. Um, I started organizing with like a mutual aid group in Little Tokyo called J Town Action and Solidarity. Um, so I kind of want, actually, as an artist, I'm interested in making like fun, like dreamlike narratives. Um, but I think I actually feel most satisfaction when I'm making art for other people. Um, so the way I present like these narratives, which are like nonfiction stories, I could kind of mix in like a little like fantastical element to the drawings and being kind of creative with the art, even though it's like a nonfiction subject. And I actually met Lindsay through organizing at the Osawa boarding house um, with Jazz. And yeah, I think this comic uh, was about like the senior tenants at the boarding house um, who are all Japanese uh, elders and yeah, kind of depicting the struggles they were encountering with their landlord and just gentrification happening in the area, which is like Virgil Village. And yeah, currently I'm working on a graphic novel about the early life of Ruth Asawa, who's a Japanese American artist and worked with Fire. Um, yeah, and it's being published by the Getty Museum next year. Uh, I think it's pretty lucky um, how I got connected with the project. I think one of the editors found my comic about the Fujimoto. Um, and yeah, that's how we kind of got connected. Um, I also feel very fortunate to be working with the Asawa family on the narrative and making sure Ruth Asawa's representation is like very true to her as an artist and person. And I think it's also an honor to work on the project. So I want to be like respectful to her legacy as can be, which I think is an important part of historical work. And yeah, the graphic novel is about her early life. Um, I think a lot of people um, like kind of are familiar with the Sawa's like wire sculptures, um, but they don't know that she had like a background in the farming family in Southern California. And so I grew up in like Torrance Gardena area. So I actually lived really close to where her family had like a farm in Norwalk. And then personally, um, I feel kind of connected with her as like, I think my family, um, they're also Japanese American and they used to have like a strawberry farm in um, Southern California. Um, but I think that's kind of what I like the most about comics, like, or historical work. Um, even when I'm, like, creating work about someone else, it kind of feels like I'm reconnecting with the people who lived on the land before me and their history. So I feel a stronger sense of place. And hopefully I could share that feeling with others through my work. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I see a lot of really positive responses in the chat. Kathy will definitely share uh, not only Sam's website, but the um, Ozawa comic that was published by um, Knock LA. Um, if, if all the panelists want to turn on their conversation, uh, I have so many questions for you all. Uh, I imagine others in the audience might as well. So I invite anyone who um, had thoughts or ideas or questions that were prompted by any of these um, artists or their their words to share that in the Q&A and, and we'll get to as much of that as possible. Um, I am excited to, to start us out. I think one thing, and this of course was on the questions that, that I gave you all ahead of time, but uh, a theme that came through really strongly in all of yours work 
is um, that that stories come from from the people who have stories about places come from the people who have lived in those places and um, connecting with those people and building trust and shaping a vision around what those stories look like um, has been really crucial to all your work, whether it's doing oral histories with elders, um, whether it's working with the numerous communities past and present that Maya talked about, uh, whether it's child actors in Elizabeth's case. Um, so I'd love to open the floor to, um, yeah, seeing if you can bring us into that process a little bit and how you built those relationships and how you um think about those those partnerships that um grew through uh the stories and the work that you developed oh i mean i think for me it's um it's it's even just down to like like the way people speak sometimes um that that kind of like where somebody comes from and like so for me it's um the nuance of the, the kinds of things you talk about. I think um, definitely with certain communities, you have to do be really careful to build trust in a genuine way. Cause I think like there's a lot of communities if you wanna tell stories about like marginalized communities, like there's probably a lot they've already been through that um, where at least for me, it was always, uh, you really need to get their story right and you also need to sort of like feel out where they're at so it's like always I guess in some ways it's like always being open to somebody not maybe wanting to share their story with you at first or being willing to acknowledge that that's like a possibility um and yeah just kind of leading with that open-mindedness of like um okay how can I do best for this person um if they're going to lend me just like their narrative and the things that they have to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll add that um, just really being on the ground um, of that place and spending time there um, and getting to know who, the community and who's connected to that place. Um, also, if we're collaborating with say the LA Conservancy, we're definitely like, putting our brains together on who they know, um, who lives there that we can speak to and just really start from that initial conversation um, and comfortability and see if they're really open to um, sharing their stories on camera. And, um, and from there, kind of see who they're, how they're relating to the space and who they're connected with. And it's very organic, I guess, for us. Uh, yeah, I agree with what everyone has been saying. Um, I think being very respectful to the people who you're like interviewing or making work about. Um, and yeah, getting to kind of know the community as well. I think for my comic about Bill Fujimoto, he is actually like a very modest person, like very humble. Um, so I think when I first asked him about like making comics about him, he was like, a bit like um, reluctant at first because I think he's just super humble but I think when you talk to the community of like small farmers that he worked with like it was very clear that they all like um, felt very indebted to him or like very uh, like gratitude so I thought it would be cool to show his story in that kind of way so I guess I, don't know, I think um, being respectful of people's boundaries is good but then also I think when the community really cherishes a person it's nice to honor that memory as well. I think, Sam, what you just said speaks to um, a larger theme that I see in everyone's work, too, which is um, elevating people who um, live in some ways ordinary lives, um, people who aren't like necessarily in capital H history books um, and contextualizing them within incredibly important um, narratives and and really elevating them to, to the place that they deserve in history. and um a lot of that you've all talked about um rewriting historical records or telling stories that have been overlooked um and that brings me to my next question which is the role of artists and cultural workers uh in social change um i'd love to hear i i know that there are some tangible things that have come out of your work maybe it's a designation maybe it's people getting to see themselves on camera or television 
um, but I'd love to hear in your words um, how you see artists as part of larger movements for social change. That's a big question. Um, yet, yeah, I think for, for me, at least, it's uh, just really being a tool for um, for the good work, the good fight, <laughs> and whatever that may be. Um, and and so uh, if my skills can um, sort of creative, creatively um, help to push that mission forward um, and to kind of like really think about what that group is trying to do, like if it's the goal is to target um, policy change people or to target, um, you know, architects and developers or, or kind of just really to just bridge uh, a universal or more universal community around a place than to, for me, it's just like a creative problem. I'm a creative problem solver and really looking at who has those strengths who can join in this project to, to really like amplify whatever that message is through media. Um, so that's, that's my thing on that. Um, I think for me, it comes from trying to empower uh, kids to feel like they see things that reflect like really the world they live in and then also reflect like that it's possible for them to be like agents of change basically um like they don't they're smart and they're funny and they're um perceptive uh and so i think it's like in just encouraging confidence in in those things um in younger people so that uh yeah, so that you kind of inspire people to like, I mean, honestly, like kids are some of the best like divergent thinkers where they'll, where they'll think of solutions or they'll see things that other people don't see because of just, um, yeah, just like almost because of where, where they're at in life, which is like just super curious. So uh, I think it's a combination of that and then just like um, trying to make more stuff that reflects uh, where everybody is at rather than kind of where just like a select few are at so that uh, you can try your best to use at least I try my best to use the medium that I like to to show people that like um, we could there's like a lot of, a lot of help <laughs> that we can give to other people and a lot of different aspects of life that we need to be aware of that exist for other people and just in order to help them and 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 all that <laughs> yeah i think like art is really i feel like feel like a good supplement to organizing that's like already there in like neighborhoods um, but I also think art's like really good also in kind of inspiring people or making them feel like more hopeful. Um, so it is good in like shifting perspectives or maybe like bringing awareness to like an issue that people wouldn't otherwise know about. Um, yeah, I also like how it's kind of good for like building community with others. Like I think at the Zawa boarding house, I was like helping like screen print some t-shirts for like some of the tenants and organizers. And yeah, it was just like, felt like building community with others, like bringing people together a bit. Those are all really, really wonderful answers and things I'll continue to think about. Uh, we've got a audience question from Andrea Mock who asks, how do you feel that your work conveys the soul of places um, so that an audience can also feel it? And I think that, you know, you all have such different mediums, maybe you can speak to to the particulars of, of your medium or what it means for a soul to have a place um, or anything else related to Andrea's question. Sure. Um, I think that um, it's kind of like something magical when you're um, starting to explore a place through the people who live there, work there, play there, knew what it was there before and you start just 
kind of like the transmission of history through people experiencing them or hearing about it and word of mouth and and their kind of like reverie and reflection on that knowing that history and being there at the same time and still uh, having a relationship with that place and you see and feel like the care that people have with these places um, is what is kind of like those magical moments I remember in making these plate these these uh, pieces and to really like um, highlight those moments you know like um, whatever if it's an interview question that leads them there if they're just walking around and they remember something it's like those moments where it's a complete reflection of this person in relation to this building in this place or whatever if, even if it's not there like that's um that really powerful stuff that i think create emits like an energy that attracts people to maybe look deeper at that place or maybe a place near you that you have a relationship to um and just look at that that's yeah, for me, it's, I think, like, um, a lot of little things combined, like, I feel like um, some people felt it just through the type of light that we would use in certain shots, like, they would say it really felt like um, Los Angeles, um, which I kind of get, it's, like, it's, it's specific places have, like, just specific details that I think if you're able to infuse those into what you put into it, um, it's it's part of what gives you that feeling of like oh this was made by somebody that's really been to that place and the same thing with the way people talk like sometimes just a slight accent or like just the the way people talk like the type of slang they use in certain places can really connect you um, in a way that makes it feel like you're really grounded in that specific place so I think it's all those little things that kind of add up that um, uh, yeah are kind of only you're only able to absorb those if you've like uh, been to that place. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I also agree with Alyssa a bit about like the little things adding up. Um, I really like when I'm interviewing someone and kind of like weaving their transcript or oral history interview into like the comics. Cause I feel like the way they describe the place, um, it just makes sense to like kind of share it that way. All right. Well, thank you all for those comments. We're right at time, and I know some of us have um, places to go immediately. So thank you, everyone who joined in and uh, shared your time, your thoughts, your ears with us, and to our panelists, Maya, Sam, and Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I've learned so much. Um, uh, we will get uh, everyone's, I know Sam has to, or Maya has to go, um, but for those who can stick around for a second, we'll um, add the contact info or the websites for everyone in the chat, and that will also go up in the follow-up email. Uh, this presentation will also be recorded as well. So if you didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing or you want to share it with someone else, please, please do. Um, this has been a, a really wonderful afternoon. Uh, thank you. I've got um, lots of things to think about and how I continue to engage with uh, historic places and the layers of people in history um, that make it what it is. Thank you all. Have a Thanks great day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. All right. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.